everyone. Um, I realize I'm a little nervous, and I want to tell you the reason why. Um, I come from a back background of victim support, and I've addressed hundreds of victim support agencies throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe. And I know that subject really well, but I consider it a privilege to be with you today to learn more about MND and how this talk about compassion fatigue uh, can assist you. So I really want to thank you for that, first of all. And, uh, and to say that Sarah set the, the course and the stage for this already by her excellent presentation. And I just want to flesh that out a little bit. Chris Wade and I designed this uh, together, and he is now the Director of Engagement for Staff and Volunteers for MND in the UK. I am still doing work with victim support, but together we saw how that original work in victim support can be extended to organizations that have volunteers dealing with high stress situations. And I know that in, in victim support, the, the similarities with MND is that it's sudden, it's a high level of trauma, it's catastrophic, and it's often fatal. And I know that because I had a homicide in my own family. So when I started this work 13 years ago, um, I'm a psychotherapist and I really learned a lot. So again, I hope this is helpful. Anyway, the point is why should organizations pay attention to CF? Sarah Jane already spoke about that a little bit, but really the staff turnover and sickness because we know that compassion fatigue affects people on all levels, mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional. And if organizations don't pay attention to it, you're investing money in your staff and volunteers and training, you're sending them out to do this wonderful work, but are you preparing them for secondary traumatization, which they will encounter? So if we want to improve staff turnover, if we want to avoid some of the sickness and the high levels of stress, then we should be offering compassion fatigue workshops. And as Sarah Jane pointed out, they do work. Effectiveness of service. Well, if you're compromised on any of those four levels, you're going to, it's going to make it more difficult to render an effective service. Well-being and duty of care. Organizations have a duty of care for their support and volunteers and their staff to offer them remedies for compassion fatigue. And by the way, compassion fatigue has been around for a long time, but it's finally getting the attention it needs and deserves. Why? Because the, the stress levels are higher and the, the trauma levels are extreme. And so we're beginning to really understand compassion fatigue. And on that note, I wanna talk about some of the symptoms. Can you all see that? or is it too small? Um, these are just a, a partial list of them. Decrease in concentration, preoccupation with trauma, anxiety, numbness, depression, anger, rage, guilt. And by the way, this preoccupation could be an unconscious. Oftentimes people aren't conscious that that's what they're actually preoccupied. And that is what's decreasing their effectiveness. Disturbance of sleep patterns, changes in appetite, irritability, hypervigilance. What's going to happen next, right? Intruf intrusive thoughts of trauma. This is particularly true in high stress cases and certainly in MND. The, the, the constant exposure to trauma creates intrusive thoughts. Loss of optimism. Is there really any hope? Increased cynicism loss of meaning, and this is a really important one. What does life mean now? Now that I've gotten this news, now that I'm dealing with this, now that I'm trying to help people, is there really, and what, what does life mean? And this is a philosophical existential question, but it's a real question for all of us. Loss of faith in spirituality, Difficulty separating personal life from professional life. This is huge, and I know it's happened to me and many caregivers and supporters. Um, you know, the ability to not take the work home with you. 
This is incredibly difficult for most of us because it is our life's work. Interpersonal conflicts. You go home, you yell at the husband or wife, you're not as, you know, you're taking that extra drink, maybe there's some addictive behavior starting to happen, you're having more fights, and you can't really understand why, right? Doing the compassion fatigue seminars is going to help you to understand that. Avoidance of social interactions. It's just too much trouble. I don't have much to give. I don't want to go out. And, and I see a lot of you nodding your head, so I think we can all relate. Decreased desire for sex and intimacy. Nobody wants to talk about that, but it's true. You just kind of, the spark's gone out, right? Uh, apathy at workplace. Staff conflicts, again, not tying it with a reason why, just thinking that's part of the job, and it doesn't have to be. Uh, substance abuse or addictive behaviors, we talked about that a little bit. This is big and often not addressed. Um, and we need to have referrals to help people with if they develop these problems. And of course, impaired work performance. Again, only a partial list. But this gives you some idea and to be thinking about what we can do. And in the first slide when I talked about the organizations need to be proactive. We can't just think about it. We need to offer training, monitoring, and support, and critically, assessment. OK, so some of the assessment and interactive exercises that I like to do in my workshops is to get people to define their role. Everybody thinks they know what the role is, but they actually don't. You forget about it because, you know, when I do this exercise, I see the Superman come out, the ass on people's thing. I'm going to go and I'm going to really save the world. Whether you realize it or not, that's what you think you signed up for. So redefining the role and getting people to have and write up a new job description. What is it you're really doing? What do you have to do? And what would you like to do? And then setting some realistic boundaries on that. So the expectations of self and others are critically important. And these are some of the techniques when the lady asked about what are the specific things. These are some of them. These are very helpful in the workshops to get people to decide truly what they're doing. And I think if you help people do that, they're going to understand their roles better, and you're not going to have the burnout and maybe the staff turn turnover, because it's a little bit more realistic. And it begins to under, help people understand why they might burn out, because if your expectation is here, you're going to fall, right? OK, so assessment of CF symptoms is a chart that I've developed and I give out. And I ask people from 1 to 5 to rate their symptoms. Now, the lucky ones will say 1. They're usually the new ones on board. Other people will go, ooh, gosh, I'm a 3 or a 4. When you start hitting 5, you've got a problem. It's also helpful for new people because they can see where not to go. And then we try to reassess periodically. And this is very useful information for people. OK, then the fifth one, develop stress management techniques and a menu of self-care options, which Sarah Jane already referred to. This is critically important. If you've got the realistic job expectation, right? You've redefined your role. You know what the symptoms are and where you are on the chart, the next thing is to develop how you're going to handle stress and how you're going to take care of yourself. OK, stress management techniques, setting realistic expectations, breathing exercises, and mindfulness. In fact, I'm going to take a deep breath. In fact, why don't you all take a deep breath after that big lunch? Isn't that better? <laughs> I have been a meditator for 30 years, and I teach meditation in compassion fatigue. And I think that is one of the best skills you can teach. And it's very simple. Awareness and setting of boundaries. Who you are, 
and what you can do and what you cannot do, right? Very important. Managing and dealing with emotions. No one likes to talk about it, but we have feelings about things. So to process with your manager or in a group or in the workshop what you're actually feeling so that you can manage the emotions and so that you're not suppressing them, which are later going to cause problems. Pacing sessions have a beginning and an end and an arc of the session, knowing what you can do within the confines. This is a psychotherapeutic technique, and when I work with people individually, I know I have X number of minutes to work. And I try to uh, construct my session so that I can cover certain things, allow for emotions, and do what I have to do. Without that sense of framing, we're kind of lost, aren't we? We have no way of regulating ourselves or the client. And that it has to do with knowing how to close sessions. You can't start closing your sessions five minutes before they're closing. You have to be thinking about that ahead of time. These are very simple techniques that can be taught in the compassion fatigue seminars that give real concrete tools, right? Okay, last, most important, develop a program of self-care. And this is where I present a menu, physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental. And each one of those categories right, has certain things that you promise to do. Now, we know you're not going to do them all, but if you make a commitment to yourself to do some of them and construct a list, you will more than likely do at least one of them. Okay, so physical, these, these are just simple ones. Exercise, walking, running, activities. Mental, changing thought patterns, letting go. These are very, very important things because if we know what we're thinking, we can change our thought patterns. We can create realistic patterns and expectations rather than going into a session blind without actually knowing what it is you're thinking and what your expectations are. This is very important. Also, you can help to recreate your sense of optimism as well, because if you clear and deep brief after your sessions and start creating positive thought patterns, you're going to last longer. And by the way, outside of your job, you're going to be happier. Emotional. Recognize the feelings. It's okay to have them and figure out a way to process them. There are many, many different ways to process emotions. Talking to a friend, talk, just you know, doing all these things. Whoops, it's the warning. Okay, social, create, maintain social engagements. How many of us go, no, nah, I don't wanna do that. I'm tired, I'm not going. Why? Yeah, part of the time that's good. A lot of the time it's because you're just too tired and you don't care. So try to create social engagements for yourself. Health, meditation, mindfulness, diet, acupuncture. By the way, I, as I said before, am a big believer in meditation and mindfulness strategies, which I think are the best and simplest. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Kathleen. Clearly a really important topic and follows on so well from Sarah Jane's. So, questions, please. Okay, in the middle. Martine Ferre, Switzerland. Um, are you giving seminars, workshops for family members, um, primary caregivers as well, for prevention of compassion fatigue, of burnout? In my own situation, I'm afraid I didn't have the time, I didn't, wouldn't have taken the time for a seminar, and my depression became afterwards, after my husband died. Yeah. I think this is often the case. And by the way, these compassion uh, fatigue strategies can work for the caregiver, the professional, the, for anyone, really. We, we can just modify that, and they are extremely important. And this, by the way, is a frontier, as I said, that 
that hasn't been paid much attention to, and we really need to. And if you don't take the time out to do it, and I, and I understand because of just how traumatic everything is, you, you will feel the effects afterwards. So it would be better to be proactive. Yeah? But, but are you giving seminars? Am I giving? Yes, I would be happy to give seminars. <laughs> yes, thank you. OK, further questions, please? Anywhere? Do we have one over there? Hi, Kim McGinnis from um, the ALS Association in the USA. Some of these strategies are really great for when folks are going along the journey and they're able to recognize or someone is able to help them recognize they might have a challenge. What have you found to be successful? Because oftentimes someone kind of crosses over and really is in a desperate situation. Do you have strategies to help bring them back so that they're able to work on some of these other strategies? Are you talking about the carers themselves and the family? I'm talking about the, the caregivers, actually. The okay. Folks. Yes. At that point, if that assessment tool has not been given to them soon enough and they're past it, which is, by the way, often the case with most people, there are strategies. Uh, again, choosing the self-care uh, option, I think at that point some individual work is going to be critically important to bring them back before they have to quit, because that is usually what happens, and we, we know that. Thank you. Thank you. And on this side of the room? Hi. Uh, Kathleen, a great talk. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering whether um, your workshop can be extended to AOS patients and their families. Thanks for that question. I, I think it would be critically important as well, because the carer who's actually caring all the time needs help and support to understand their own feelings. And I know as a, a victim of a family homicide, before I started doing the work, I had to get help to understand how I could deal with my son's murder, how I could deal with my other children. And that was an ongoing. So yes, often we're the last ones to get care. And it is really important. So yes, I, I can see where that would extend. It adapted. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anywhere else? Rod, can I have a mic over here, please? Uh, Rod Harris from Victoria. I, I'm a firm believer in preventative work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's incumbent on all our organisations when we're working in stressful environments like this to have preemptive activity going on, one-on-one right. uh, -on -one support, right. uh, the opportunity to have counselling, uh, team activities that help people address and resolve issues that they're experiencing. And then uh, non-attributable counselling if people need that next phase. Right. But it's certainly a lot easier to prevent it happening yes. than recover from it. Absolutely, absolutely. And as Sarah Jane said, the we, the, you know, if you do that ahead of time, you will be much better off. Thank you. Okay, and Kathleen, thank you once again yes, for your presentation. Yes, and thank you for the thank privilege you. of being here. Thank you. Thank you.